Hi, welcome to Tabs Two Cents, a show where we talk about finance, business, and achieving success. Today on the show, we have Paul Halmy. Paul is a ex stockbroker and he now runs an MMA gym and consulting business. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Tabs Two Cents, the show for average Joe investors where we talk finance and how to achieve success. Hey, Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Joe. Glad to be here. Yeah, no problem. So I thought we could just start with a little introduction, uh, who you are, kind of what you're up to with uh, finance and business. Yeah. So my name's Paul Halmy, live in uh, Texas, been down here for quite a long time. Did a, a stint as a stockbroker for six years and then got hooked on entrepreneurship and jujitsu and MMA and the whole world of the UFC. Did that for a few years, coaching people and doing that. Still have a gym, still do consulting, but my favorite thing, you know, is investing in the markets, although I'll Obviously, the last couple of months has not been a lot of fun, so it's it's one of those bumps in the road. I've seen them before, so you just got to power through them. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, today um, we get a little bit of a bump today, but you know, it's <laughs> markets have been tough lately. Um, been rough. Something I thought I wanted to ask you about: How does it compare working it as a stockbroker as to run your own business? Because you're kind of analyzing businesses on one side, and on the other side, you're actually owning and operating one. Yeah, it's totally different. I I tell people I would never trade the skill set I got as being a broker, learning about money, understanding investments, things like that, talking to people just, you know, over the years, you talk to so many people that are so much older than you, you start learning things, you're like, Oh, man, I really need to know this when I'm older. And unfortunately, our school systems, like in the US, we don't cover any of this stuff. So it's like, you have to figure it all out yourself, which is, you know, horrible, we should have more education on it, because it gives you an edge. So you know, when you moved into entrepreneurship, then I had the financial skills that not a lot of entrepreneurs have, because most of them are just going so hard and trying to grow their business. And so where I've helped people a lot is teach them about you're growing your business. Yes, but also you have to keep investing and and, and doing that. So the transition was awesome for me. Yeah, I completely agree. Here in Canada, we don't really have that education either, which is, you know, a big part of the reason why I started this show is I want to help people out. I noticed a lot of people who have left reviews for you and things like that. They say you talk about passive investment and building up some investment in different methods of saving money. I wonder if you talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So for me, it's always been the stock market. You know, people are like, oh, the market goes down. It goes down sometimes. Yes, of course. But I mean, I, I survived 2001. I survived 2008. You know, we've been lucky. Like this generation is kind of spoiled because we haven't had a real down sell for what, 14 years. You know, we had the one last year, which was real short or sorry, two years ago, but that didn't last very long. So now we're kind of feeling some, some pain and, you know, going through the last two years, obviously no one's enjoyed the last two years. So being a non-essential business, which is an MMA gym and then consulting for non-essential businesses spent the last two years, like really focusing on diversifying investments. And what's cool is you're seeing so many opportunities out there to invest in different things. So, you know, they can be, you know, obviously I tell people to cover your basics, you know, in the US, your IRA, your retirement accounts, things like that, emergency funds, savings, and then investing. But then it's so cool because now as the world's changing, you're getting more and more opportunities where you can invest in other businesses, uh, invest in real estate through funds instead of having to deal with being a landlord. And so for me, the last couple of years has been really spent looking at ways to get into things that create a passive income that weren't tied to the market because I'm so heavy in the market. I'm like, I should really balance this out. I'm getting older. I'll be 50 in like four years. So you know, it's kind of the halfway point. So I've really been focused on that. And it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I agree. I think multiple income streams is huge. And, you know, it's not always easy to build those. I know for me, I, I've been looking at real estate, but up here in Canada, like it's such a bubble up here. It's crazy. Like it's, it's way too expensive. I think in my opinion, to get into that market at the moment. Yeah, it's gone and, insane. Oh yeah. Like it, when you look at the income to cost of living in Canada, it's, it's a bit of a stretch. So I mean, I would never try to time that market, but it's definitely <laughs> just, it's just too much money. You know yeah, what I mean? I told my wife, if our house goes up another 20%, we're going to have to, you know, we'll figure something out. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, to me, I'm like, uh, who would pay this for my house? It's like, you can have it. It's like, I'll take the profits and book it into something else and live in an apartment for a couple of years. I mean, it's, I would never pay what people are offering for the houses in my area. And I'm like, man, another, <clears throat> another 20% and I might be out and then just experiment and try apartment life for a couple of years yeah it's really tough to know what to do yeah. in those kind of markets and I, I know like with side hustles and income streams and like <clears throat> even with this podcast for example like I don't make any money on this but I'm definitely learning a lot of things about social media about building an audience about timings and structure and different business things that I think would be useful if I was to move on to a real business like like you have so I wonder is there anything that 
you could sort of pass on just as an entrepreneur yourself to people who may be looking to start a, a new side business? Yeah, everything's changed a lot. People are looking for different things now after the last couple of years. And the biggest thing I tell people is find something you like, <clears throat> you know, make it, if it's a hobby, something you're really interested in and, and go find somebody that's doing it and be, and just offer an internship for them. Be like, Hey, you know what? I really like this industry. I'm thinking maybe it's something I could be interested in. Could I come work as an intern for 90 days? You don't have to pay me anything. And then at 90 days, you can see if you want to hire me. And I tell people just work in some different industries. I was lucky uh, before I was a stockbroker, I was working for a company that had a bunch of a uh, small family owned company that had a bunch of franchises, like they had like uh, six uh, GNCs in the US. And so I got to see behind the scenes of like how they, their struggles, their ups and downs. And I was like, oh man, this is interesting. This is a lot of work and it's hard, but it gave me a little bit of an edge because I had, you know, I'd worked for, I wasn't working for a corporate company. I was working for entrepreneurs, you know, so I guess he's called me an entrepreneur back then, but I was a kid and was just trying to figure stuff out. And then getting into the, being the stockbroker doing that. So then when I transitioned over into entrepreneurship, it was a lot easier because I had been around entrepreneurs and started seeing how they were doing stuff and, you know, and what their struggles were and what they were looking for. So it was, it was good. It's good experience. Did you do MMA for many years before starting a business and that, and just kind of knew that you really liked that or was kind of working towards a space in the market that was up and coming? Cause I know the UFC really boomed about 10 years yeah. ago. Yeah. So we, I started my gym in 2003. So it was right, right when the wave was starting. So the, yeah, the UFC was starting to take off and starting to boom. And I'd been doing jujitsu. I'd moved here in 97. So I guess that was about six years. So about five years into that, I was, I was training. I was helping my best friend who had a gym and I'd, I'd help him with his stuff and finances and go through his books and help him like try to figure out what he was doing. Cause he was busy. He was trying to get in the UFC and he eventually made it. And that made a big defining moment in my life. Cause he was going to the UFC and he's needed my help. And I'm like, Oh man, this it's going to be a lot of work. I only get, you know, luckily I'd been at my job long enough where I got four weeks vacation plus some flex time and stuff. So I'm like, oh, okay. But you know, then my wife and kids are like, not wanting me to spend all my vacation at UFCs. So I ran into that thing where I'm like, man, I got to figure this out. So my wife was like, well, I'll just start a gym and try it for a year and see what happens. And so, yeah, I had a love for MMA and jujitsu. So it was an easier transition for me because it was something I was super passionate about. And then when the opportunity arose and I was like, man, I really got to figure this out. Then we just jumped on it. Yeah. And the reason I bring that up is because I think in fighting and I've done some things myself, I've obviously <laughs> never fought in the UFC, but I've trained, I've done kickboxing, I've had some amateur kickboxing matches. So That's awesome. I understand that, you know, there is a lot of pressure and a lot of discipline and a lot of really good characteristics that are built up in fighting. Did you find what you've learned through fighting leading into that that it helped you in the business world? Oh, a ton. Yeah. I mean, even like you said, even a, people are like, oh, I just had an amateur fight, but people don't understand. It's like, that, that's hard. That's stressful. It's scary. It's like, I always joke around and like, everybody was in high school and nobody wanted to get in a fight in high school unless you were a crazy kid. So then people are like, what's fighting like? I'm like, well, it's like, imagine you're in high school and everybody's like, okay, you know, Joe's going to fight Steve behind the building at four o'clock in front of 2000 people and a little pair of shorts. And you got six weeks to think about it. I mean, it's horrible. Like the lead ups, just people don't realize the mind game. It's like, yes, it's physical. You have to be in great shape. That's a given. If you're not in good shape, and you're not training hard, you're going to get destroyed. But even if you're doing all those things, right, it's still a mental game. Your mind is just constantly like, oh my God, oh my God, what did I do? And then the day of you're like, I'm insane. Why am I doing this? This doesn't make any sense. And part of you, and I'll be honest, what part of you doesn't even want to do it. Like you're, that day, you're just kind of like, oh my God, it's like, I don't want to do this, but I have to, because I signed up for it. So that helps a lot with entrepreneurship because you're going to be under stress. Sometimes you have to make tough decisions. And that's what I love when they love about jujitsu and MMA is like, you're under so much pressure and it's like, you're trying to solve a difficult problem and your heart rate's at about 160 beats per minute. You're exhausted. And then you got to make a decision where it's like, if I make the wrong decision, I could get knocked out or I can get choked out. So when you come to business, you're like, okay, this is really bad. So let's slow it down. Let's not react real fast. Cause that's going to be the worst thing I can do in business. It's like, what are my options? Okay. Start looking for it and then look for the answer. And you're like, oh, okay, this wasn't so bad. I, I, you know, I got through it and just learn how to relax under pressure is the biggest thing for me. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I mean, the pressure of losing a business financially, you know, is obviously from a life standpoint, huge, oh, way huge. bigger than getting punched in the face. But in the moment, the threat of getting knocked out would probably feel a lot scarier. Yep. Oh Yeah. And it translates really well because, you know, we're, we make tough decisions in entrepreneur, we make tough decisions as investors right now. It's like, how many people are like right now, like, oh my God, this guy's falling, sell. And I'm like, just need a few more people to go crazy and sell. And then we hit the market bottom. It's always how it works. It's like the average investor's mind is backwards. They buy high and sell low because they're like, oh, the market's going up. I got to buy. And it's like, 
well, you should be buying all the time and dollar cost averaging and all that stuff. But it's like the market goes down. They're like, oh my God, I'm selling everything. And I'm like, okay, cool. We're getting close to the bottom. You know, it was like, I look back at it and it's like, cause I've been around this game for so long. Like, it's like that when you hear people talking about like, oh man, it was just, when Bitcoin was at its highest point, I had friends that were messaging me like, hey, I think I should get into Bitcoin. And I was joking around with some of my friends. I'm like, dude, we should sell everything because we have this one friend who's just a complete knucklehead. And every time we talk about investing, he just rolls his eyes and he's like, oh, I hate listening to you guys talk about this, blah, blah, blah. Well, he hit me up in November about like getting into Bitcoin. And I was messaging some of my friends. I'm like, dude, we got to sell everything. I said, we're at the top. And literally we were, you know, the market tank from that. I'm like, man, it was all right there on the wall. It was like, the market was super high. Everybody's like, oh, we're going in, we're going in GameStop to the moon. And, Bitcoin. and it's like, I look back at it, I'm like, man, I could have saved like half my Bitcoin if I just would have sold it all and just waited. Yeah. But you never know when the top is. But, you know, you got to learn to deal with that pressure. And you don't, you, if you believe in the companies, you can't sell at the bottom. It's, you know, you, it's high, the guaranteed way to lose money. Sell at the bottom. <laughs> it's like, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the canary in the coal mine sometimes is just when you start hearing everybody saying, oh, you know, why would I buy a GIC for well here in Canada, we have GICs are 3% yeah. guaranteed income certificates. They say, Oh, why would I buy a GIC when I can just buy, you know, Tesla and be up 20% every year. And yeah. it's like, well, that's not how it works. You know, <laughs> not wait till the year that you go down 50% and then it takes forever to climb back up. You don't, you need more than 50% to get back the 50 you lost. Right. So it's, it's really difficult that yeah, way. It's tough. You know, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, just cause you're a business guy and you're an MMA guy. When you measure success, sometimes people see it differently. So, you know, an MMA is a good example. Some people may say that, you know, GSP is the best ever, of course, up here in Canada. We're, yeah. we're all yeah. about GSP. Legend. A legend for sure. But then others may say, well, I think Conor McGregor is the best fighter ever because he, he brought notoriety to the sport. He's, he's the wealthiest fighter. How do you try to measure success in the business world? What do you think is going on there? Man, that's a great example because you go GSP. It's like I got to meet GSP, before, you know, when he was like just this little guy that was just coming into the UFC. And, you know, I saw him fight at UFC 50. So that's how old I am. So it's like, you know, go through it and see all those things and do that. So, you know, when you look at it, like GSP hands down is one of the greatest fighters of all time, just because consistency, just the guy's work ethic. He came every time he fought, even if he didn't want to fight. It's like he he fought like that one famous fight when he's like, I hurt my groin and Greg Jackson's like, well, hit him with it. You know, it's like he just kept going and going and going. But then you get a guy like Connor, who's just literally keeps losing and makes more money than everyone. It's like he figured out the social media game, the marketing game where GSP was good, but he wasn't great at that aspect. He could have probably had a but, you know, even when he. When he tried to be, you know, controversial, it never worked because he's such a nice guy. You're like, you can't even be controversial. Just stop. Don't even try. Like he would try, but it's like doing that. But then you get Connor is just such a marketer, such a showman. So you see on that, like, oh, if you're in business, then you start to understand like, okay, unfortunately you got to get good at the marketing and stuff like that. So for people want to go into entrepreneurship, I tell them, it's like, man, if you want to go into entrepreneurship, you have to master marketing and sales. I don't care how good you are at jujitsu. I mean, I know world champions, that are a hundred times better than me that have gone out of business. Cause they don't like, well, I am the champion. People will give me money. It's like, it doesn't work that way. It, it's like, they might not even know you're in the same town. It's like, you have to market. People have to know you're the only choice in town. And then you got to know sales, but having that little, you know, not as brash as Conor McGregor, but you have to be state, you have to stand out and make yourself different and getting on video. Like every gym owner I talk to like, Oh, I don't want to make social media videos. I'm like, well, you have to, or go get a job. It's you have to market, you know, unless you're somebody like incredibly famous and you can just run basic ads, but you know, it, it was cool to see the contrast because GSP was just such a man watching his career was amazing. And then you watch Connor, it's like his young career in the UFC. I was like, oh, he's going to lose. And he kept winning. And now I think he's going to win. He keeps losing, but he keeps making more money. And he's good for the sport because he brings everybody's pay up. But I think if you go down actually fighting skill, yeah, GSP is way better than Connor. Yeah, I, I always find it interesting to compare greatness in individual sports and in team sports, because when you look at somebody like Connor, they would say, oh, he's the greatest ever. But if he was on a hockey team, you know, with, like I'm, <laughs> I'm Canadian, of course, but yeah, of course. we could say yeah. football, say he's on a football team and he's the loudest wide receiver out there, but he's not that good. Yeah, Nobody is ever going to call him great, regardless of how many people come to watch him in the stadium. So I think that that's really important. I mean, for anybody who's looking to start a side business, like they really got to dig in there and learn the marketing and learn how to, have to. get themselves out there. Otherwise, you, it doesn't matter how good you are. You're probably oh, yeah. going to fail. Without a doubt, you have to get good at the marketing. <laughs> mm -hmm, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, we might as well, since I have you here, we talk a little bit about investing. Um, what are you looking at right now? 
Man, it's crazy. So my favorite one has been Amazon the longest. So I'm getting murdered right now. So I was by, I have a funny story. So, you know, I grew up, no one ever taught me about investing. So I always made a, a point to teach my kids about investing. And then the kids at my uh, MMA gym about investing. So we had a stock contest back in the day. And my son was really young and he's like, I'm going to buy Amazon dad. I'm like, Oh, it's a great one. You know, buy that. And it was like 300 bucks a share. And he's like, after the contest, he's like, Oh, you should buy Amazon. I'm like, Oh man, it's crazy. I'm waiting for it to come down a little bit. So it's, you know, it's never come down, you know, ran from 300 to 3000 something. Of course, now we're seeing a huge pullback of like whatever 30%, which is insane. But to me, it's like, I'm a big fan of the Peter Lynch model where it's like, you know, if you're using stuff, buy stocks and the stuff you use, it's like, I'm not getting rid of Amazon anytime soon. Yeah. I don't know why the stocks come back, but I just keep buying more of it because I'm like, until my wife, stops having Amazon packages come to the door every day, you know, uh, that stuff. So Amazon's a big one. You know, that's one of my favorites. Uh, in the US, I love Chipotle because the food's fast and easy. You know, I think they have a lot of good potential. So for me, a lot of stuff I look at. And then of course, like the most basic, boring thing you can do is the Warren Buffett model is just buy the S&P 500 and just forget about it, you know, and just keep dollar cost averaging. To me, that's, as you get older, you start to get like, man, I got to stop chasing some stuff and just keep compounding good returns. So of course, always the S&P 500 for me, you know, and then some pick up some smaller ones like Amazon and stuff like that. I'm always watching those. I kind of have a tendency to look at the big picture. I'm sort of like a macro guy. Yep. And uh, what I've been leaning towards lately, rather than individual stocks is sometimes an active ETF or fund yep. or smaller, more condensed ETFs. What do you think of the strategy uh, between an active fund or a passive fund? You know, it's, it's the active funds are good. I mean, you can use an example, like the horrible one from the last couple of years is ARC. Like ARC was like the most, you know, badass thing of all time. And everybody's like, get an ARC, get an ARC. And now it's down like 70%, you know? So depending on the manager and what's going on, it can get a little crazy, you know, where it's passive and, you know, some of those ETFs that are more balanced, you know, is a good way to go to me more than like, I've made some mistakes where every time I chase a high performer, it always kind of backfires. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah. And like, for me personally, I've been looking at like a Canadian, Canadian oil ETFs is where I was kind of watching just given the circumstances and the energy security things that are going on lately. Do you prefer a mix of individual and index funds then for yourself? Or would you just for most people probably recommend, a, you know, Vanguard S&P or yeah, I'm a huge fan of like, you know, the index ETFs, especially as you get older and asset allocation and having all that stuff the right way. But I still like to have fun. So it's I still set aside a little bit of money where it's like, you know, okay, we're going to buy some Amazon, some Netflix, you know, some Bitcoin, stuff like that and, and play with that money. But the core part of the portfolio, yeah, is definitely a balanced mix of ETFs because like I said, you know, four years, I'll be 50. So it's like my risk tolerance has to adjust because it's like, oh man, you know, how long are we going to live? You know, what's going to happen next? It's like, it can't be, you know, like, you know, if you had all your money in ARC, I mean, last year's has been brutal if you're, you know, older. So it's like, you got to have, you know, a good balance. Yeah, I definitely agree there. And I think that you made a good point in that like fighting, investing can be emotional. Oh, you know, it's almost like, I don't know if you would work this. I'm not, I've never done any kind of pro MMA, but how do you deal with guys who want to go for the knockout all the time? Because I think that's very similar to people who just want to go for the big wins all the time. And you know that if you stick to your game plan and fighting, you're going to have a better chance at winning. Now, maybe the game plan is to knock the guy out, which if you have a power puncher or whatever, that could be the case, but they can't just be throwing bombs all the time. They have to no. set it up. They have to pretend to take down. They have to throw in some feints. They got to make sure that they're doing the right things. How do you deal with those emotions? Because I think that that could carry over into investing as well. Some of those lessons learned. Oh yeah, it's huge. Like especially in MMA, when you're training people, you yeah, even if a guy's got a big power punch, you don't want to have that the thing he leads with because everybody's gonna yeah, he might get you know a couple of good fights and after that everybody's gonna be like okay, this guy just comes in, he does this, this, and this. Once once you turn professional, they have tape and stuff. Even amateur, high level amateur, they have tape on people. So you know, if that's something everybody does, it's like no, it's horrible. You have to have a you have to disguise it. It's like people always talk about like Chuck Liddell was like you know, back in the day, an amazing striker and he would knock people out. But the reason he was so good is you couldn't take him down. He was a collegiate wrestler, but he never wrestled anybody. He just would counter wrestle and punch people in the face. But so you had to deal with that. That was a nightmare. But if Chuck would have gone out there and just thrown bombs without having any wrestling, he's going to get taken down. Guys are going to figure it out. That's why he was one of the most prolific knockout guys is because you couldn't take him down. So same thing with like investing, you know, your fundamentals going, but even with Michael Jordan talking about, you know, back in the day, it's like, he'd start every practice with chess passes. So it's like, what are your, what are your investment fundamentals? Do you have an IRA? Is it set up for your, you know, 
the proper asset allocation for when you're going to be retired. Okay, cool. You got that done. Cool. Now have some, you know, now then have a brokerage account and put all your knockouts in there. Like, oh, okay, you know, my moonshot or my, you know, hopefully Amazon hits or, you know, like I had a good round with Amazon. Of course, lately it's sucked, but I'm still, you know, way up from when I bought it at. But, you know, to me, that's like, okay, I don't see that going away anytime soon. You know, it's just a monster. Like we have Amazon over by our house. I see planes flying all day long. They're Amazon planes now. I'm like, okay, this, this is insane. They're, they're, just, you know, Apple, things like that, that have just been, you know, crushing the market, but having those is like the fun. Cause that's the fun part about investing. When you do get it right. You're like, oh, cool. I'm a genius. I got it right. But you're not fluctuating with your whole portfolio, like just putting it into something crazy speculative. No, I completely agree. And it, it's really interesting because I'm like a fitness guy, but I'm a finance guy too. And I actually had a pro bodybuilder on and he was talking about nutrition and, and how some of those lessons and discipline and long-term outlook look, uh, carry over to investing. And w with fighting, it's, you know, it's very similar because I think with investing, I, I like to say you've got the YOLO monster. Everybody, <laughs> everybody has that inside of them. And you, you, you sort of, I think you sort of need to put some money away to feed that beast because what we also have as humans is a recency bias, right? So if say you got, you know, $500 that you're going to YOLO with, it's going to feel way better or way worse when you hit on that or lose. But meanwhile, you could have 10 times that money sitting in an index fund and you wouldn't even think about it. Yeah. So it's almost like, I think it's almost like a distraction, the yellow monster. It's, it's good in some ways because you can kind of play around in the market and, and forget about the rest. And in fighting similar, you know, throw a big punch every now and then, just not all the time. Yeah, it's not all the time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know if there if there's anything else you want to add. Just um, s some lessons you've learned along the way. You've obviously been doing this longer than me, so some some things that stuck with you, kind of like the way I said the the yellow monster. <laughs> yeah, the yellow monster. Yeah, that's a great example because it, it's fun when you pick a winning stock. You're like, oh, okay, I did this, I did that. So it's like always have your, you know basic portfolio, retirement portfolio, you know, follow the traditional model on that asset allocation, risk tolerance, all that stuff. And just really do your best to not be speculative with that because that's the foundation. That's the fundamentals. That's the main piece. Then of course, yeah. Then if you have your retirement or your non-retirement account and you're doing some stuff in your brokerage, have X amount of money, you're kind of like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to invest with this. Cause the thing I've learned the hard way over the years, you know, being in the market since I started in 2000. So, you know, it's been a long time. But every time I got caught up in the hype of like, oh my God, this is the thing, I've lost money. It's like, it's consistent. Like it always happens whenever I get caught up in the hype. It's like, and you still get caught up. It's like, okay, you know, oh, we got to do this. We got to do that, you know, and then just crash. It's just like, you don't want to buy the hype, you know, so find stuff that you is before it gets hyped up, that's kind of building up and then look for those types of opportunities. But yeah, if everybody's hyping about it and talking about it, then it's like, it's time to get nervous, you know, when everybody's all in. Do you mess around with trailing stops or do you stop limits or anything like that to kind of keep yourself from becoming emotional? You say, okay, look, I'm up 50%. I'll put a trailing stop for five. So I, I can at least lock in some of those gains. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely recommend trailing stops. Yeah, for sure. Unless, unless it's a stock where you're like, oh, I just a hundred percent believe in this one and it's not a ton of money in your portfolio, then you can just kind of let it run. But trailing stops can be huge. Especially when like, you know, if you look at like the last three months, if you'd had trailing stops in, you know, at a 5% or something, you'd have been totally fine. You'd be out of the market for the last three months on those things because it's just nothing's done well, really. So, you know, but in the long run with your main portfolio, I don't even worry about that. Like you were saying earlier, it's like put it in balanced ETFs with proper asset allocation and just let it run and look at it in 20 years. As long as you got a long time frame, just don't mess with that money, you know, but the fun stuff. Yeah. If you're playing with like your your YOLO bag or whatever, and it's not a huge part of your portfolio. Yeah, you're trying to lock in gains because you don't want to lose money on those. And then you're just and messing around with that. So one piece of advice I got when I first got into crypto is I talked to one of my friends. He was super wealthy that I've known from jiu-jitsu. He's probably 20 years older than me, but and he doesn't like the stock market. He's more of a real estate guy. And I was like, oh man, I'm really thinking about this Bitcoin thing. And he's like, well, let me give you a piece of advice someone gave me. And he's like, only invest the amount of money in something super speculative that you're willing to go in the backyard and set on fire. And I was like, that really makes sense. Cause it means something totally different. I mean, if you're younger, that might be $500. If you're older, it could be 10 grand where you're kind of like, you know, I know friends that go to Vegas and blow 10 grand in a weekend, you know, I'm just like, Oh shit, that sucks. So it's like to those guys, yeah. Putting 10 grand into Bitcoin or Ethereum or something. So they don't, it doesn't phase them because they have way more money than somebody younger. But if you keep that risk tolerance where you're like, okay, would I set this money on fire? It's like, nah, I probably shouldn't take out a second mortgage on my house and buy Bitcoin. Cause when you read stuff like that, that's terrifying. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I've, I always say 
only invest what you can afford to lose. Yep. And, and you know what, to be honest, I think that's sort of with, with everything and that includes your entire portfolio because you never know what's going to happen in equities. Some people have to build their retirement that way, but you know, if you can't afford to lose it, if you can't keep the lights on, you probably, you should be more concerned with that. You yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. You can, you can maybe find that. something else to cut out to invest with that money, you know? I think one of the issues that we're seeing right now is lots of people do have those trailing stops. And that's that's why the markets get so crazy is because especially at the hedge funds who control all the money, those guys are, you know, they have to maintain their capital. They can't just let it ride like us. What do you think about that? Yeah. Oh, that stuff gets crazy because you look at those guys, they're moving huge amounts of money to try to move the markets. And the funniest thing is, you know, you look, at, I forget the Warren Buffett quote is, but most of them can't beat the market. They can't beat the S&P 500, most of them. And everybody's like, oh, I'm going to find the next fund. And it might do well for a year, but, you know, it's so tough to figure that out. So, yeah, that makes it tough when they're moving so much money, they can move the market, especially in the summers when volume's lower. That's why it always gets kind of scary, you know, because it's like the market can move a ton and you don't know what's going on. Then you get stopped out of a position and then the next day it's up 8% and you're like, oh, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> it's almost like what we talked about earlier with Connor how if you want to make money in the fighting business, you have to be able to advertise yourself and market. And I find in markets, sometimes you have to just accept it for what it is. For example, sell in May and go away. Yep. I'm like, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to do that. I don't care if it rhymes. Like, this isn't <laughs> going to happen. But every May, it goes down. And I'm like, man, if, if everybody thinks it's going to go down in May, maybe I should start being a little more cautious in these months. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's oh, yeah. really is a popularity gets, contest sometimes out there. Yeah, the volume gets so thin in the summer. So it's like the market can move a whole bunch either direction. Yeah, and that's a good point. I've never really thought about it as the volume. But yeah, that is probably what's going on. So with that being said, I think this has been awesome. I think yeah, I've had a great time. Yeah, there's so many similarities with with, you know, fighting, fitness, finance, it's, it's because it's all up here, right? It's all mental at the end of the day. We're all humans other than the, the robots out there doing all, their, <laughs> the, all the you know, high frequency algo trading, trading or whatever. So, you know, us with our monkey brains are trying to compete with those robots. But, you know, at the same time, they're still programmed by people, too. So there's always, you know, that to fall back on. So, yeah, I just I wanted to just thank you for coming on the show. This has been awesome. Yeah, I had a great time. It was very fun. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, no problem. Joe is not a financial advisor and may have interest in the stocks discussed on the show, so do not take any information included within this podcast as a recommendation or formal advice. Thank you.